Uh, good afternoon, welcome. Uh, I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this event in IPI's speaker series featuring Kamar Rabbit, the Director of the International Atomic Energy Agency's Office of Nuclear Security. That office, based at IAEA headquarters in Vienna, provides advisory services to states for establishing the necessary infrastructure to protect nuclear and other radioactive materials from theft and diversion, to protect nuclear installations and transport against sabotage and other malicious acts, and combat illicit trafficking in nuclear and other radioactive materials. The threat of nuclear terrorism is real, and states have national responsibilities to combat this threat, and our speaker, Kamar Rabbit, is going to explain how the IAEA assists states in meeting these responsibilities. In your papers, you have the full biographies of our speaker, Kamar Rabbit, and of Jeffrey Shaw, uh, who will make opening remarks, but let me briefly introduce them to you. Kamar Rabbit joined the IAEA in 1986 and became director of its Office of Nuclear Security in April 2011. That experience has included uh, ranking posts such as head of the Safety and Security Coordination Section, chairman of the Coordination Committee, and head of the Regulatory Infrastructure and Transport Safety Section in the Department of Nuclear Safety. He earned his doctorate in nuclear physics at the University of Strasbourg in France. And Jeffrey Shaw has been the representative of the Director General of the IAEA to the United Nations since February 2010. And during that period, he has also co-chaired the UN Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force. Excuse me the UN Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force Working Group on Preventing and Responding to Weapons of Mass Destruction Attacks. The Australian government seconded him to serve in Vienna from 2004 to 2007 as Special Assistant for Policy to the IAEA Director General, and he has represented his country internationally on issues related to disarmament, non-proliferation, nuclear safeguards, and nuclear security. Now we're going to begin our program with a 10-minute IAEA video that shows some of the challenges of providing what the agency calls cradle-to-grave accountability of nuclear and radioactive material at a time when both the peaceful and malicious uses of such power are growing around the world. The biggest risk is posed by those states that do not have 
any nuclear security infrastructure those states that do not recognize the threat of nuclear terrorism and those states that are complacent because terrorists will find the weakest links so what do we mean by nuclear security the IAEA has a clear definition nuclear security is the prevention and detection of and the response to theft, sabotage, illegal transfer, unauthorized access, or other malicious acts involving nuclear material or other radioactive substances. So in short, nuclear security is all the measures to protect nuclear or other radioactive materials from falling into the wrong hands. Good morning, sir. Thank you very much. One of the IAEA's principal tasks is to assist states to build nuclear security systems which are robust, sustainable, and effective. It's a big challenge when you consider the widespread use of radioactive materials. Nuclear material and radioactive substances are part of our daily life. We use them in industry, we use them to generate energy, electricity, we use them in agriculture, we use them in medicine for diagnostic and treatment. Also, we transport annually more than 20 million packages. All these have to be protected and made secure. The world's increasing need for a secure source of low carbon energy sustains many countries' interest in nuclear power. Nuclear power has to be safe and secure and peaceful. So nuclear security is an integral part of the global nuclear security that each country should have to introduce nuclear power. With several states seeking to introduce or expand existing nuclear power programs, highly experienced teams of specialist IAEA advisors are on hand to assist states to build a strong culture of nuclear security. <coughs> Their facilities are well protected by tried and tested physical barriers, where radiological sources are securely transported and stored where there's an active, ongoing plan to recover orphan sources, and where the byword of all nuclear and radiological material is cradle-to-grave accountability. Key to fighting the war on nuclear terrorism is working with states, law enforcement, regulatory authorities, and international organizations to identify trends, assess threats, and strengthen states' nuclear security systems to prevent radioactive material from falling into the wrong hands. The Illicit Trafficking Database is a network of over 100 member states. Information reported to the ITDP demonstrate that the availability of unsecured nuclear and radioactive material persists. That also effective border controls measures help detect and deter illicit traffic, and that also individuals are willing to engage in traffic in this material. All radioactive sources of isotopic, chemical and physical signatures, which could be likened to human fingerprints. It means that out of regulatory control, radioactive sources recovered by law enforcement personnel can be traced back to their point of manufacture by nuclear forensic scientists. Their findings can lead to criminal prosecutions. This, in turn, can be a deterrent to those contemplating the unauthorized diversion of radioactive material. The IAEA has a large number of programs to assist states building nuclear security infrastructures. Our agency is dealing with this helping states to have safe, secure and peaceful nuclear energy 
by dealing with this in an integrated and holistic manner, we are the unique organization within the UN mandated to establish guidance and standards that are recognized worldwide as a reference, as a benchmark when it comes to the establishment and maintenance of nuclear security infrastructure. We also is help establish nuclear legal instruments where the binding of non-binding instruments and we help member states to meet those obligations. We do also help states in assessing their infrastructure, in identifying their gaps, and work together with them to rectify those weaknesses and gaps. How we do this? We provide advisory services to them, we provide peer reviews, we provide education and training. Our education and training program has been recognized worldwide. We have more and more requests to meet those needs, and we are organizing many training events nationally, regionally, and internationally. We do also prepare many training packages, and many countries are asking for more. Major public events like the Olympics and World Cup draw hundreds of thousands of people from around the world to congregate in one location. They're an obvious target for nuclear terrorists, so the IAEA provides, on request, specialist teams to assist states to train security personnel in the detection of terrorist radiological devices in areas of high crowd density. These training and advisory programs, along with many other initiatives set up by the Office of Nuclear Security, are warmly welcomed and received by those states who request them. We do measure the success of the nuclear security program by many parameters. One of them is the increasing use of our guidance and standards for nuclear security. Also, another parameter is the our condition by other major players within the UN system, but also other initiatives that recognize the leading role of the International Atomic Energy Agency in establishing standards and guidance and in providing the nuclear application. <coughs> in conclusion, then, the states continue to provide evidence of an ever present and very real global threat of nuclear terrorism. The IAEA's global response is a call to every state for coordinated cooperation and collective action to prevent unauthorized access, to detect illicit trafficking, and to respond effectively to malicious acts involving nuclear or radioactive material. The key word is vigilance, at all times and in all places. Discussion. And I want to thank you, Warren, for that warm introduction and also the opportunity to once again work in partnership with the IPI. Our last event that we did collaboratively was in February earlier this year, and we focused on the IAEA's contribution to sustainable development, explaining how we assist member states to use nuclear technologies across, across a range of issues, from food security, like climate climate uh, smart crops, human health, for example, in the treatment of cancer, in water resource management, mapping out underground aquifers to work out if the waters are sustainable, energy and in the environment, for example, monitoring ocean acidification. Today, our focus is on nuclear security. And the video we just saw provided an excellent overview of nuclear security, what it is, what, why, why it's important, and how the IAEA is helping states upon request 
to keep nuclear and other radioactive sources out of the hands of terrorists. And so I'm delighted today to have my close friend and colleague, Dr. Kumar Rabbit, here to elaborate and to explain how the IAEA is working with partners, including across the UN system, to build a strong and sustainable global nuclear security framework. But before handing over to Kamal, I'd like to uh, point out that we have some publications at the back of the room, uh, which explain in a bit more detail from the, uh, some of the issues raised at the, in the video. And also to like to announce that the IAEA will be hosting International Nuclear Security Conference in Vienna in July 2013. And the aim of that conference is to further strengthen nuclear security across the globe. So let me finish. I trust that you'll find Kamar's presentation to be engaging, and I very much look forward to a productive and fruitful discussion following. Thank you. Kamar. Good afternoon to all of you. I'm really honored and very pleased to be here with you and sincerely thank you for taking time and being here to share with us this session and also to hear from you, to learn from you and through your feedback, your contribution, certainly we will continue improving nuclear security. At the outset, I would like to thank, of course, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Warren, and also Jeff, and also IPI for making this excellent arrangements and also for their efforts to have such events. I'm really thankful to all of you. What I intend to cover, you know, here is first to provide you with some background information. You have seen a lot, of course, from the video and also from the introductions from the colleagues here and to put things in perspective. And then I will share with you what we have been doing and what we will be doing and the role of the International Atomic Energy Agency, its activities to contribute to the global nuclear security framework. And then certainly, of course, in any activity on any important you know, project or program, there are, of course, challenges. There are also opportunities. So this is, and then, of course, we will have questions and answers, and I will be very pleased with also Jeff here to provide you with more details about other you know, issues that I would not cover because we have a short period of time. So we well, certainly, of course, as mentioned also in the video and you know, before, that there are many b beneficial activities and practices you know, resulting from the use of nuclear material and other radioactive substances for nuclear peaceful applications. For example, for nuclear power, see here that currently we have you know, 435 nuclear power plants in operation generating electricity. And the expectations that such nuclear power program will increase in the future because of the driving you know, factors are still the same. And I think this is, of course, we will have details you know, later. At the same time, there are also research reactors. You know, there are more than 232 research reactors using also nuclear material, highly enriched uranium, for example, and also they are generating or used to produce radioisotopes for medical applications, for example, where, as mentioned you know, by Jeff before, that there are millions, or you heard also in the video, that there are more than 30 million of nuclear medicine applications for diagnostic and therapy purposes, but also millions of radiotherapy procedures annually to treat, for example, you know, cancer. There are also many other you know, activities that, because of the shortage of time, I will not cover all the applications. 
But these beneficial applications, if they are not the material that is used, the nuclear material or the other radioactive you know, substances, if they are not well controlled, then because of malicious acts, they could be used to make more harm than good. They could contaminate the environment. They could also be used against you know, people and also against the society. So therefore, this material and this activities should be protected and controlled. And this is, this is why the threat, as mentioned in the, also the video, is real, and the possibility that nuclear or other radioactive material could be used for malicious you know, purposes that could really make harm to the people, the environment, and the society. Now, also that the threat, of course, you have heard also in the film, that there are many things that really criminals or terrorists could use such material you know, to make harm. For example, nuclear weapons or nuclear material to make improvised nuclear devices using, for example, highly enriched uranium or you know, plutonium. Also, that there are radio, radioactive material to be used, for example, for RDD. And these are the dispersal you know, or dirty bombs, if you wish. And here we are talking about millions, exactly, of radioactive sources that are used for medical, for industrial, and research. And if they are not controlled, also, this is also a big risk. But also, there are, as I mentioned before, many facilities like nuclear power plants, research reactors, and so on, that the sabotage, it's also a risk that if these facilities are there is sabotage, then radioactivity could be released, and again, it could harm the environment and people. So this, the risk is there, the risk is real, and of course, member states that have the main, the primary responsibility for the security and safety of such material and facilities and activities, they have to, have, to establish and maintain adequate infrastructure to secure such material. And of course, those states, as mentioned also in the video, that do not recognize such threat, that this is also a risk, or that states do not have any prevention action because they believe they don't have nuclear material. Any state on Earth has radioactive material sources used for medicine, for, for also industrial applications. So we cannot say the problem is only the problem of big countries. The problem is the problem of everybody, and it's a global issue. Also, that states that are complacent, the moment you believe there is no problem, everything is under control, then the real problem starts. So I think we have to be aware you know, of this. Now, why I am saying exactly that the risk is real, because from this international illicit trafficking database that has been also mentioned in the film, we have cases and we are still receiving incidents from states showing that material is still out of regulatory control, that there are people still trying to use or to sell or the, as a result of theft or as a result because the material is not as at full control. And we are trying this database that we have created in 1995 because there were many incidents on nuclear security. And this was created and we are collecting all this information from states and also any information coming from the open sources. We check with the member states to make sure that this is true. And then we share such lessons and such also experience with the member states with a view to improving again nuclear security in those countries. We have so far, since the creation of such database in 1995, we have 2,242 incidents. These are not only incidents on, on nuclear material, but including everything, radioactive sources, and also orphan sources, anything that is out of any regulatory control and that could be used for malicious acts. For example, you know, here I will give you an example, a recent example from last year in Moldova. And here you will see that 
There was a case on one year ago, on the 27th of June 2011, where a case here on the open source reported that law enforcement from Moldova reported that, that they have seized a quantity, I mean, small quantity, of highly enriched uranium during the sting operation. So this is really real. And based on that information we have received, of course, our role is to check that the information we receive or we get through open sources, that it's real. And we contact for this, the point of contact in each state, and we ask them to confirm whether this is true or not. So, and this is what we have received also from, for that case from Moldova, reporting to us, confirming, yes, this has happened, and yes, this is the situation. Based on that, then we inform, according to our procedures, we inform all the other contact points in 114 states, but also other international organizations like, of course, you know, Interpol and, and others, and the World Customs Organizations to tell them that this has happened and this is the situation. So only to tell you this is one concrete example involving highly enriched uranium. Now, if we go to give you a little bit more about this case, and you will see that this is a video we got from Moldova. So, let me only see, let's see what's uh, whether it's here. So it will take time because it's a... No, sorry, it's... Why it doesn't... Uh, if you don't mind, let me go back to it because it didn't... Should should work. Up. This is one of the IT. Sometimes there are surprises. It was working. But okay, so it's really strange. But anyway, only to show, I, because still here, this is really a video. If I try the last <laughs> chance, because this I cannot believe. We tested this before. Why it's... Uh... Okay. Trust me, I don't know, him. Jeff, you have seen this third video before. So, this is where you use another system. So, it's only that video has shown that the case was filmed, and that case exactly, that tangible success was a result of our cooperation between the International Atomic Energy Agency and member states. And here, the, the equipment we have provided to Moldova and also the training we provided to the regulators there, to the agents from, for example, from law enforcement, you know, staff from the police, from all those involved in nuclear security in Moldova, that they use such experience and knowledge and such equipment to identify, of course, the highly enriched uranium and also to take the necessary measures. So this is exactly what's happened, and this is explained in, in this video. But unfortunately, as uh, it's not working, I will have to skip and continue. There are also other examples you know, here where I am showing you what's happened again with cases where highly enriched uranium was also seized. For example, in, total, in 1999 in Bulgaria, we have exactly customs officer arrested one person trying to smuggle a container with approximately 10 grams of highly enriched uranium across Bulgaria's checkpoint. Okay? And according to the press reports, the ample of uranium was hidden inside a tire pump in, a, in the blood, in, in the boot of a car coming from another country. So this is, of course, the quantity is 10 grams, but of course, this could be only a sample of a bigger quantity of highly enriched uranium. At the same time here, I am showing another example in 2007 in Slovakia, where also another open source 
New source reported that two individuals were also arrested in Slovakia, and one person was arrested in Hungary who were to sell one kilogram this time of radioactive material. And this is, again, uh, was also the perpetrators were, uh, perpetrators were detained and also at a broad, uh, as border crossing point. And this was confirmed also in January 2008. Last example here I am showing it's from Georgia in 2010, following again an investigation. You know, the, the Georgian security services intercepted three men and they had in their you know, position 15 grams, and again, of highly enriched uranium. And there are many other examples showing that such material is out of regulatory control and there are people trying to smuggle and also to sell you know, such uh, material that could be used, as I said before, for malicious acts. Now, here, when we talk, I mentioned several examples of highly enriched uranium, but we do have also in such database of illicit trafficking many other radioactive sources that also could be used for dirty bombs, I mean, to contaminate an area and create a real problem. So here, for example, you have gorgeous exactly of these are gorgeous used, you know, for uh, this are category for five sources, not the, the most dangerous ones, but also that they could also make harm. There are several, calls, for example, you know, sources here for radiotherapy or radiography, you know, cameras, or also other industrial, you know, sources. And also here, sorry, it's, it's here that we have, for example, this is a source that exactly was used for therapy, and it was in another country where several people died because the material was out, was out, was out of regular control but was not used for any malicious act, but still it was out of regulatory control. So here, in summary, only to show you that such a high number of illicit trafficking events do exist for both nuclear under the radiological you know, sources. Now, what the agency of the International Atomic Agency is doing to help states establish and maintain an adequate nuclear security infrastructure to reduce or to eliminate the number of such uh, events. First, as we said, and you heard several times, nuclear security is the responsibility of states themselves because this is the responsibility to protect their people, their environments, against also these uh, malicious acts. But our role is to work together with our member states to help them establish such good infrastructure by helping them to have guidance, by providing them expertise, by training their people, and also by internationally establishing conventions, instruments that would help globally improve nuclear security worldwide. Now, we, what we do is part of something bigger, what we call the Global Nuclear Security Framework. As mentioned earlier, we are not alone. There are other players, of course, organizations, international organizations with the UN, other initiatives in the worldwide, member states themselves. So I try here to show you all the players, for example, at the UN here, you will see that we are working together with many players within the UN. For example, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1540 Committee. It is a committee that is working, also having a role also in nuclear terrorism and also for the prevention of WMD, weapon of mass destruction and also they are contributing to the global <coughs> nuclear terrorism to improve the situation. So here, uh, the, 1540 com committee is mandated by the resolution 1977 to continue to strengthen the role to facilitate the provision of technical assistance to states because this is mandatory and then our role is also is to work with this committee to help states meet those obligations. We're also working, as Jeff has mentioned, with the UN Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force that has also a mandate to coordinate and, co the, and uh, also and cooperate 
also in, in within the system, the UN system, and the agency has participated in the work of such groups. And Jeff, as was introduced, was one chairman of one important group there. Now, also we have here, let me go, I hope this time it will work, because this is uh, it here. Yes. So now, this, we mentioned the UN and international initiative. I would like also to share with you here what is being done at the international level when we talk about international instruments. Well, certainly it did not work. I cannot believe this. I should have used, this is when you move to another system, it's always a surprise. Yes. So here, these are also important elements for this global nuclear security. The first one I'm selecting here, some of these instruments that are playing an international role. Convention of the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material. This is the only convention that is dedicated fully to nuclear, physical protection of nuclear material and associated facilities. And this was, it's entered into force in 1987, and so far we have 145 countries, parties to this really convention that deals with protection of nuclear material when it's international transport, okay, among other things. But as this was only dedicated to nuclear material for during international transport was not sufficient because you have nuclear material, as we mentioned, also at the national level and used in many activities and also stored and transported domestically, not internationally. So therefore, there was a need to amend such you know, convention and make it more global, extend it also to nuclear material used domestically, stored or transported domestically. So this is why there has been an amendment in 2005, and so far, unfortunately, we have not reached the level where it should enter into force. We are making every effort to do that, but still, we are far from that. There's another also important convention, which is also very important for uh, nuclear terrorism and nuclear security. And this is the Convention for the Separation of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism. And this one, it's entered into force in the UN you know, uh, Convention. It's working, and the agency has a role also in that convention, because anything that has been seized as nuclear material, the country in question has the obligation to use international standards for safety, security, and, and safeguards to use them to have or regain control over such material. But there are also other you know, conventions, as I said, like UN Security Council Resolution you know, 1540, but also other non-binding, because what I mentioned here, these are binding instruments, but we have also non-binding instruments at the international level, like the Code of Conduct on Safety and Security of Radioactive you know, Sources. And also another important document on the physical protection of nuclear material and associated facilities. Let's see exactly another element of such also this global nuclear security framework. And this is where our agency, International Atomic Energy Agency, is establishing what we call guidance, or if you will, standards. And this is the reference for the standards that each country would adopt. These are not mandatory standards, but that would adopt also to establish such nuclear security infrastructure. We have so far an important number of such standards that member states are using to establish their nuclear security infrastructure. And for this, this is the only organization that is mandated to establish standards based on the international instruments and convention to help countries in this area. So we do not only establish guidance and standards, we do also work with our member states to apply them. And this is exactly how we do it. We do it, oh, sorry, I mean, <laughs> how this really the system I have really to go back, it's not this one. 
it is not taking the right, uh, it should be here. Let's hope it will. Yes, this one, okay. So now this is how we do it, it worked. Now we do it, we provide peer reviews to states based on their request, and we help them to assess the situation of their nuclear security infrastructure. By doing this, we work together with them to identify gaps and together to rectify those gaps. And here, let me only take only one example to be not to take a lot of time here. It's this International Physical Protection Advisory Service. And here, we have already organized 55 missions to our member states to 37 states since 2002. And what we do here is we go to a country based on the request from those countries, we assess the effectiveness of their physical protection for their nuclear installations and nuclear material they have, and then we help them to identify any gaps. But at the same time, if there is any best practice, we disseminate this to the others to improve nuclear security. This is a service that it's being used by developed countries, developing countries. For, your, for an, As an example, the US has requested officially this year to have such peer review of one of its research reactors using highly enriched uranium. So the agency will come together with the US experts, make an assessment of the situation, the physical protection of such installation, and also may, make recommendations for improvements. So we have such peer reviews in many areas, and I will be very happy to come back and provide more details depending on where you want exactly that the Taizum. But there are many services that we provide to our member states to help them improve the situation. Now, another area we provide to our member states, and they see here many young uh, part, you know, exactly uh, participants here that would be interested in education and training. Where here we have a big program on nuclear security for education and training. We have created what we call a network for education in nuclear security. And now we have, you see here that there are, we created this network of universities, institutions, that would for the first time this year start delivering a master of science in nuclear security and also within the US, in Europe, in Latin America, and in all the regions. And this is exactly for the first time there will be a master degree in nuclear security. At the same time, we are complementing this by creating another network you know, here that it would be for training the, at the professional level. And for that, we have developed more than training, 30 training packages in all the areas exactly of nuclear security, whether it's detection, whether it's prevention, whether it's response. And we have trained, you see here, more than 12,000 participants from 100 states. But we still believe that demand is high and through this network that such universities, such institutions, such centers will provide more training. And they will be very happy also to provide more details depending on the questions. You see also another service that was mentioned also in the video that there are a lot of major public events, whether sports you know, events or whether exactly political gathering and so on. And of course, this could be targets for malicious acts using nuclear or other radioactive materials. Therefore, many member states, they will come to us and ask us to help them to establish a strategy, to train them, to train the people, give them also uh, equipment, and try to work together with them to avoid any malicious acts using nuclear and other radioactive substances. And we have many here events that were organized together with the agency, and also there will be, we have already received also requests for future years. So I think this is an area where we are also doing uh, quite a lot. Let me now move to the last exactly area here, so it's, it's coming. Yes, it's our member states as part of this global nuclear security framework. Of course, member states are the key, as I said, they are responsible for nuclear security, but also with them, we achieve and we establish such global 
nuclear security framework. And of course, they provide inputs to our standards. They provide also inputs to other initiatives worldwide. We are not alone, but at the same time for education and training. And here, what I would like to emphasize here that our approach to nuclear security is holistic, it's systematic. What we're trying to do with each state receiving our assistance, we sit together with them, we establish a plan. What should be done by the country? What should be done by the international community, by the International Atomic Energy Agency? And together, we implement such plan. Our approach is systematic. We do not want to wait until there is a big disaster. We work with each country, we establish such plans, and then we try together to implement these plans for all the areas to have an adequate nuclear security infrastructure. So uh, this is our approach. We So far, we have here 67 plans for 67 countries. And we are aiming at, by next year, as Jeff said, there will be a big conference in 2013, that all the countries receiving agency assistance will have a plan for establishing and implementing uh, a nuclear security infrastructure in those countries. And hopefully by doing this, we will have full global nuclear security worldwide. Now, this, having mentioned this, okay, it doesn't, let's go more this way. There are other examples here I would like to summarize here with the member states. We have done a lot. I'm only taking some examples to illustrate what we have done. You see here that, for example, 110 sites in 30 states, we have helped them to upgrade their physical protection of their new installations. We have provided, for example, for more than 4,007 radioactive sources were secured because they were not under adequate security and then also uh, we have provided here, you see, 170 sources repatriated to suppliers because the countries where the sources were used didn't have the infrastructure to keep them in a safe and secure manner. And also we provided here a lot of capacities for their border control to detect any movement of any material that is out of regulatory control. And this is against, of course, illicit trafficking uh, is trafficking purposes. Now, quickly, I would like to say a few words about the challenges. You have heard a lot of achievements, but there are, of course, challenges facing us. We're trying exactly here, or we aim also to have an establishment, the establishment and strengthening of a coherent, comprehensive global nuclear security framework. You saw that examples of international instruments, what the agency is doing in terms of standards, what everybody is contributing, but still, we do not have yet a framework that is functioning. For example, for nuclear material, I told you about the amendments of this convention that did not enter into force, although the amendment has been approved in 2005, meaning that we have still to do more to, in order to have such instruments entering into force and also something that would not only deal with nuclear material, but also with radioactive sources, meaning that internationally there is also an instrument that would give the same protection as for nuclear material. Now also what we would like as a challenge is the implementation of all the recommendations, our guidance and standards. As you mentioned to you, there are many standards but there is one weak point that when it comes to the implementation of some standards, there is a lot of work to be done. And this is why we are working with each country to have a plan with a view to implementing and using such standards. There's also a provision for comprehensive education training program. As I told you, a lot has been done, but the demand is high and we have to work together to have sufficient number of well-educated and trained people in each state because every state at least has radioactive sources used in medicine, industry, agriculture, and other applications. Of course, there are opportunities. There is greater recognition of importance of the nuclear security, and this is, and we're very happy to see many, many people here aware of what is going on and willing to learn more about this. But of course, unfortunately, still some countries believe that, there are, that what nuclear security were trying to do sometimes is that there are more requirements and this is sometimes perceived as a hinder, hindrance for the promotion of nuclear technology. But this is what really would like to do more to avoid such perception. 
There's also recognition of the agency's role is as, an, as a really a global platform for nuclear security. And this is what now building on this and doing together more to improve nuclear security. And also, we would like to have an established mechanism for promoting nuclear security with other stakeholders. As I said, within the UN, there are many players, there are other initiatives, and we are trying to work together with them to move together to implement this and reach this common goal of better and global nuclear security for all. So this is what uh, I wanted to mention. This is our Director General attending the last nuclear security summit in Seoul. I'm sure you heard about this in, in March you know, this year, where again, this big event, this big political support for nuclear security has recognized the important role, the leading role of the International Atomic Energy Agency for having safe, secure, and peaceful applications of nuclear and other radioactive substances. Again, with this, I thank you. I'm sorry the video didn't work because the link was missing. And I will be very happy now with Jeff to provide you with any clarification or answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Kamar. Um, uh, now is the moment to uh, involve the rest of you. If you had any questions or comments, uh, raise your hand and I'll get the microphone to you. We are video uh, webcasting this. Um, and so when you get the microphone, please hold it steady. Uh, don't gesticulate with that hand, because otherwise the sound will get lost. Uh, over here on the right first. Uh, I'm Shirley Chesney from the NGO Committee on Disarmament, Peace, and Security. <clears throat> Last year, a group of scientists came after the terrible accident in Fukushima, and they disputed the official account of the nation state, Japan, about what was really happening and the effects of the radiation on the populace and the environment and the seas and the food supply. Are you able to go into a nation state only on the invitation of the nation state? Could you elaborate in the confusion that I have about what is really the truth of the situation? Could you tell uh, more about what you can do in the case of a meltdown or in the case of an in inadequately uh, operating nuclear facility Thank anywhere you. in the world. Thank you, Shirley. Good question. I think I'm going to take two more questions, sure. if you just wait for that. Um, uh, well, for the gentleman in the middle and the woman right behind him. I think um, we'll stop at three, and then we'll come back for another round of three. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mrabit. Uh, welcome to New York, uh, and nice to see you again. Um, you have a very special. Can you introduce itinerary. yourself, please? I'm sorry, Omni from the Mission of Morocco in New York. Um, you have a special itinerary. Uh, you have worked quite a long time on safety. Then you worked on, uh, you headed the coordination between safety and security. And now you are heading the, the Office of Nuclear Security. Uh, we would like to benefit from that and just uh, briefly uh, uh, describe to us what is the relationship between safety and security. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the woman right behind you. Well, thank you for the very interesting presentation. My name is Jessica Bufford, and I'm with the Office of Disarmament Affairs. Uh, I was struck by the number of incidents of trafficking of radiological and nuclear materials since 1995. And yet, we have not seen a successful nuclear radiological terrorist attack. And so I was wondering if there have been any efforts to understand why we have not seen that yet, and if that information is being incorporated into the global security framework. Thank you. Thank you. How would you like to? OK, sure. You want to go ahead? 
Let me start maybe exactly with the, maybe the last one, and then I move forward, okay? You're right. I mean, when you see this number, you know, more than 2,200, you know, events since, uh, you know, 1995, is really a high number, but still, as you said, there was no nuclear security incident, real one. What this is like, you know, for safety, people may believe that accidents might not happen. But as you know very well, accidents do happen. And uh, there are many examples, whether it's Fukushima or Chernobyl and so on. This also means that for nuclear security, there is a probability that this would happen. Simply the number, as I said, of radioactive you know, sources, not all of them are uh, well protected, not all of them are you know, well controlled, but also that there, you know, the, the, the situations have happened, but they were not, did not result in release of radioactivity. You know? But it's not because it did not happen that we can conclude it will not happen. So it's better to prevent rather than to mitigate. So prevention is one important principle in nuclear security, but we have to detect any also illicit trafficking, and we have to be ready to respond such, such, should such event happen, and they will happen, because simply it's like also for uh, nuclear accidents you know, in, in safety. The second question, if, if you allow me, Mr. Chairman. Of course, so, exactly. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> That's for also safety and security and uh, relationship. Well, there are, these are two areas that have things in common, but at the same time, they are separated areas. As we said, nuclear security, it deals with the prevention, detection, and response to theft, sabotage, illegal transfer, also other malicious acts that are not, you know, like for safety, we're not talking about the same thing. But at the same time, between safety and security, there are common areas. First is the global goal, because the goal of both areas is to prevent, or if you wish, is to prevent or or to protect you know, the environment, the society, and also individuals from harmful, you know, exactly effects of ionizing radiation, whether exactly resulting from an accident or from a malicious act. But the specificities, they do exist, but the common areas, there are many common areas. For example, if you take uh, the defense in depth, meaning for safety, you have to have redundancy you know, to prevent when there is something that doesn't work as expected, that you have, you know, several uh, uh, areas where you have redundancy that you could prevent things to happen. At the same time, this defense in depth, it's also a principle that's used also for security and then reinforce also security and vice versa. But there are specificities, specificities to each one. What we're trying now to do more and more is to promote where we have the synergies between the two. And we're establishing guidance and standards to promote such synergies. And you see more and more countries now, the regulatory bodies are trying or are regulating both safety and security of nuclear installations, of radioactive you know, sources, because there are synergies between the two. But having said that, we are not saying that everything is really should be integrated because there are specific issues for both safety and security. But I will be very happy, I don't want maybe to go into a lot of technical details, but I can give you more technical details about the two. The, the first question was about Fukushima and why exactly the, the binding character or, or non-binding character of our guidance and standards. Well, for safety and security, as I said, this are the responsibility are with the member states themselves. We do prepare standards and guidance based on international conventions, based on best practices in member states, 
but these all standards are not mandatory. So they are mandatory for the countries that <laughs> adopt them, and also mandatory to the International Atomic Energy Agency when we help member states. If they request us, then we have to use them while helping those countries. We use them as guidance for helping such countries. But what is happening more and more, you see that such guidance and standards are recognized internationally and used by member states. And the member states are asking for what we call peer reviews. And those peer reviews is to go to the, these countries and check that what they are doing is in line with international guidance and standards. And then any deviations or any gaps, then we tell them what should be done to rectify them. At the same time, if we identify any good practices or best practices, then we disseminate this to others to improve safety and security. And you see now that you have heard that we have even an uh, an action plan for safety that has been approved uh, last year uh, through an inter a ministerial conference that the agency has organized. And that such plan is being implemented, including, among other tasks there, is to improve nuclear, sec nuclear safety standards. So we are working also revi revising, reviewing our standards to, again, take into account the lessons learned from Fukushima. So in short, our standards are not binding, but de facto more countries are using them and are becoming de facto the norm. Thank you. Uh, I may have misunderstood Shirley's question, and if I did, it, 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 there's a question that I want to ask you, which I think she was also asking, which is, uh, do you have to be asked to go in? In other words, suppose, yes. um, is that, I mean, suppose the country says, no, we don't want the IAEA here, and yet you recognize there's a problem there. What do you do? What, because our standards are not binding, it's not like you know, the safeguards, you know, because there's a, a treaty NPT, so therefore when the country has signed and there is a, a, you know, exactly a, an agreement uh, with them, it's, it's mandatory. For standards, it's not mandatory. So we cannot go to a country and say, we must check your safety or security infrastructure. We cannot. But however, we, the country, when they ask us to help them, then we apply our standards, it's mandatory. So if a country asks us, please come and check, then we use our standards and then we told them this is what has to be done. But we cannot oblige them. We do not have that power because we are not an international regulatory body. Maybe if, if my I, colleague will yeah. give more details. If I just can add a couple of other points. Um, it's all a question of legal authority, as Kamal is saying. We don't have legal authority. The question of making it mandatory was, in fact, raised by some member states following the accident of Fukushima, but there was no political appetite to go down that path. What was decided was to strengthen these uh, measures that we have impl being implemented under the nu Nuclear Safety Plan. If I can come back to the question about the link between safety and security, another dimension where it's linking is that after the accident in Chernobyl, we had established across the UN system an interagency mechanism for responding to a, a nuclear safety accident. That has evolved over time and it's now responding to any radiation emergency, um, whether it's from a malicious act or from a safety. And once there's an incident, and Fukushima is a good point, it's activated. The agency acts as the coordinating within a number of other agencies, involves the WH World Health Organization, involves the Secretary General's Office that involves the Food and Agriculture Organization, humanitarian assistance organizations, and we try to coordinate responses and how we're going to deal with that, that crisis. So after the accident in Fukushima, for example, we sent teams in with the FAO to monitor food, monitor radiation levels on food. We sent teams in to monitor radiation levels in the marine environment. We sent teams in to look at the reactor. We sent teams in now dealing with the question of remedi remediation. And we do that not in isolation, but we work with our UN partners on that aspect as well. And then we try to disseminate that information. Great. I've seen six hands. I'm going to do it the order in which I saw them. I think two in the back. Pamela, you raised your hand. The gentleman next to you, and then Harriet Mandel in front. And then we'll do another round of three. Thank you. It's Pamela Falk from CBS News. Thank you. And uh, to both uh, Dr. Rab Rabbit and Dr. Shaw, this database, the IE Illicit Trafficking Database, it's pretty shocking that there are 2,000 incidents since uh, 
1995. How much of that can you source to countries? How much of that data is it, uh, available? And is it only given to the host country when you find it? Uh, um, or by per again, back to permission, by permission going into the database? Sorry, uh, if it goes into the database. Uh, and how much does that have to do with the well-known cases of Iran and Pakistan in terms of sales of illicit, tra uh, illicit materials? Thank you. The gentleman next to you. Thank you. I'm uh, Khalil Hashmi from Pakistan Mission. Um, <laughs> it's uh, good to see uh, Mr. Marabit in New York. Uh, thank you very much for a very uh, informative and useful uh, presentation, as always. Um, two uh, questions. Uh, within the nuclear security discussions, uh, you're very familiar with three themes. One is coordination, the other is synergy, and the third one is duplication. Now, there at, at various levels, whether it is a normative area or a, and it's, it's an operational area, there are various streams of things um, which are in place. You mentioned some of them, or most of them here. And now, looking at it from an IAEA's perspective, I mean, it's, it's, it's good to hear that a lot of these efforts or uh, initiatives work for the same objective, and that is to have a, an enhanced level of nuclear security across the board. But when you get to the details, there are some areas for instance, the detection and the forensics and others, where it is very important to have global standards or definitions of uh, commonly agreed definitions. If such efforts are undertaken by a select group of countries, that poses a problem later on for, you know, for various reasons. So what is IAEA, as, as, as someone who is at the almost center of these things, how do you think that these issues can be addressed? The second specific question is on uh, nuclear terrorism convention. What exactly do you see the role of IAEA in terms of capacity building of states, in terms of promoting uh, uh, this issue? And I, I, I would leave uh, the comment on illicit proliferation on Iran and Pakistan. I don't want to get into debate, debates. These are closed chapters. Thank you. OK. And Harriet Mandel. Much. Um, thank you, Warren. Uh, thank IPI for this really enlightening presentation and for all of the words that you've, you've spoken here. Uh, my question has to do with civil oh, society. Sorry, introduce my, yourself. Uh, Harriet Mandel, uh, Jewish Global Associates. Um, my question has to do with civil society. Um, this is uh, obviously an issue that confronts everyone on the planet, and it seems to hover above it. And uh, it's very difficult, and so much of what you've spoken about seems so technical and um, confined to groups and to actors who are very um, specific in this field, but it depends on all of us. And uh, rec recognizing that there are resources that are very, uh, very limited in how much you are doing, um, I I'm very concerned about awareness, education, and involvement of civil society in this project. So, thank you. Okay, come on. Okay. Can you tell me on Jeffrey just to... You want to, to go ahead? Awareness? Look, I might uh, kick, off, kick off this time. And I'm going to leave the... Pamela, your question to Kamar, because it's quite technical, and uh, I'll leave it to him to answer those specific questions. Um, the, the, I, I, the, the question about global standards, yeah, absolutely, that's why the agency is developing the standards when we're trying to get everyone to buy in on them. And I think we find our member states' support is very strong on that. Other players working in that space, in this space across the UN system and, and elsewhere, recognise that we need to have one set of standards and are supporting us in trying to develop those and move those forward. So I think that's a positive. Maybe Kamar can say a little bit more. It, there was a question about the Nuclear Terrorism Convention. Um, was that you? Yeah. Um, well, clearly, we work closely with our UN colleagues in implementing that convention. But how we assist, and you talk about capacity building, is the core to preventing nuclear terrorism is having strong nuclear security. And that's our mandate, is on the nuclear security. So that's how we help our colleagues here in New York implement that convention, by building capacity on the nuclear security side. 
And the final question about civil society, yeah, absolutely. Um, we do have civil society work. We are working with civil society in this space. Kamar didn't mention a lot, but some of our other partners. We've talked about the UN partners, but we also have civil society partners. For example, there's the World Institute for Nuclear Security, which has been established, um, and we work closely with them. We also work with um, think tanks and people who can spend some time, academic institutions who can give a bit of thought to and a bit of analysis of what we're doing. In fact, we had a meeting earlier today with a particular organisation discussing that, asking them, can you analyse where we're doing? Analyse how we've been going, analyse where there's potential gaps and where we can move forward with the goal to try and to strengthen what we're doing. So we have, I think Kamar mentioned that we have, and I mentioned this international conference next year, and there will be a session again where we want, uh, we want all the players involved. But come on. Okay. Well, thank you. But coming back exactly to this global standards, and you gave a specific example about nuclear forensics. So sorry a little bit. I try to avoid technical issues, but sometimes I have to because it is a very specific question. I mentioned in the presentation that we are mandated as the only international organization to establish guidance and standards as really a benchmark, taking into account international conventions and instruments, but also best practices worldwide. And this is very important because if we have one set of standards and benchmark is one thing. If we have more, we will make more or create more confusion than helping nuclear security. So therefore, your question about whether there's another one doing this, in the past, of course, there are initiatives. One of them is the global initiative that was also, and it's still playing a key role, where they started preparing such guidance. And we had discussions with them, and the situation has improved a lot now. All what they prepare is sent to the International Atomic Energy Agency as inputs that we use for establishing guidance and standards globally. One of them exactly, as you mentioned, is nuclear forensics. Recently, they have prepared a document on the issue where we contributed and we received it and we will revise our existing standards taking into account their input. So in short, the situation has improved a lot, and we, as Jeff has said, we are organizing annually twice a year meetings on exchange of information with all these players within the UN initiatives, international initiatives, and other organizations. We put everything on the table. We explain to them what we are doing. We ask them also to tell us what they are doing, and then we agree on what should be done to avoid duplications and more importantly to avoid contradictions. So only to tell you the situation has improved and when it comes to global standards, it's worldwide, it's recognized worldwide that is the International Atomic Energy Agency establishing such guidance and standards based on international conventions and instruments. So I think from that angle, I think really the situation has improved a lot. And also, uh, the capacity building, quickly, only about the capacity building, as Jeff said, we have, our approach is systematic and holistic. What we are trying to do with each country, we sit together based on this guidance and standards we're establishing. We make an assessment with them. We identify the gaps against those guidance and standard, and then we work together with them. They will do their part, we will do our part. So this capacity building is done in a systematic way with all the countries cooperating with the agency. And as I said, we have 67 plans and we are aiming at having by next year before this conference that we will be organizing next year, we will have nearly 110 plans either established being implemented or are in advanced stage of finalizing such plans. So capacity building, including what the other organizations are doing, for example, if you take the 1540, all the obligations needed from the legal regulatory point of view will be included in such plan we're establishing with the countries to help them deal with this so that they can meet the obligation, the international obligations. So this is how we are doing uh, this, this business. The ITDB, you, you, you're right, you mentioned 
that uh, it's, it could be, yes, uh, frightening when you see, of course, 2,224 you know, you know, cases. Uh, yes and no. Yes, because we do not, we want to reduce this number to the minimum, meaning that you will not find any material, nuclear material or radioactive material out of any regulatory control so that then by doing this you will reduce the probability that this could be used for malicious intention. So this is the ideal you know, goal. But at the same time there, the number is high because we are also asking those states participating in the R114 to report anything, even if it's, as I said, a radioactive source of the fifth category, which means really a smoke detector, for example, you know, which is, you would agree with me, it's uh, not harmful, I mean, relatively speaking. But at the same time, it's a question also of security culture. If you control all your material, this is the only way to make sure that the system is effective enough and everything will be under control for any radioactive material used or stored or transported. So this is why from these 2,200 something you know, events, you will find less than 1% is involving, and they say less than 1% is involving, for example, highly enriched uranium and plutonium, meaning nuclear material that could be used for, of course, you know, uh, uh, weapons. So, so this is why I said yes and no. I hope that I covered this, you know. Uh, gentleman in the third row, then here, and then was there a third? Oh, and then in the aisle back there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Murabit. Um, my name is Tomoaki Shigaki. I'm from the Japanese mission to the United Nations. Um, this is not the question, but maybe just a brief comment. Uh, first of all, I found your uh, presentation to be extremely timely and useful because in light of the recent discussion that the Security Council, which discussed the issue of non-proliferation, the 2,000 cases uh, of these uh, incidents are the very clear examples of what uh, you know, the international community uh, should tackle, and this was a very um, clear example. Uh, just touching upon the question about the, from the um, member of the civil society on the Fukushima, I just like to add what uh, uh, Shaw uh, Jeffries has said on the uh, lessons learned from Fukushima. Uh, just briefly, yes, I mean while Japan ho hopes to learn so much from the lessons from the accident in Fukushima, uh, we are also aware that n not in these all circumstances uh, everyone agrees on all these you know, new standards or the guidelines that to be established. But I think that's where the idea IAEA's uh, importance becomes even more relevant because IAEA sets up even though voluntary uh, objective standards that we also agreed and implemented by uh, all member states, including Japan. And I think this is one of the key, uh, say, maybe uh, lessons in a hard way that we've learned. And just like to um, share with you with the floor that uh, people in this room that um, in December, uh, there will be an international conference co-organized by IAEA and Japan and try to get all the lessons learned uh, from the, uh, the damages and devastations from accident. And I think th this is also the very good way that uh, we can uh, use the uh, experience from the IAEA's expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Carl Robichaud, Carnegie Corporation of New York. It's my understanding that each nuclear facility when it engages the Office of Nuclear Security and it's trying to design its nuclear security measures, first comes up with a design basis threat, correct? That it identifies what are the plausible types of threats that this facility may face. And as you noted, in the past 10 years, we have had to reimagine what might be possible on the, pa on the part of non-state actors. There have been incredibly sophisticated attacks, not only in New York, but in Madrid, London, Mumbai, et cetera, that expand this, this threat, in my view. And I'm wondering, I've heard that a lot of countries have an outdated version of this design basis threat, and their facilities are imagining an old type of threat rather than what they might currently face. When, when you're asked to come in and comment, 
can you say, yes, you meet the mandatory standards and the requirements as outlined in the official documents. However, and you may say this discreetly, we believe that your design basis threat is outdated or that you may not be preparing for a full range of possibilities. Is that, is that something that you can provide to states? Thanks. And finally, on the aisle. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bulgarian Foreign Ministry. I have a follow-up question of the two of the previous questions related to the high number of detected uh, attempts for illegal trafficking. Uh, I'm afraid that a uh, far greater number has been undetected, which happens in many other fields. So my question is, first, do you have an estimate of how many attempts uh, went successful? And second, uh, fortunately, we haven't seen any terrorist attack using uh, such elements. Uh, uh, however, you said that 1% could be used uh, from what I got for uh, something more serious, but uh, whether some greater percent cannot be used for uh, creating a dirty bomb, for example. And uh, if that's the case, uh, do you have an estimate how real the threat is? Thank you. This will be all the time we have time for. Okay. Well, and maybe let's start exactly with the design basis threat and the DBT. Uh, let me start by saying that we do have guidance and standards that we have established and are being used by our member states. We have organized nearly 50, you know, workshops to explain such methodology and what should be done, and member states are using this. And also physical protection, when we talk about physical protection, this is based also on this threat assessment or the design basis threat that countries have been dealing with, when it comes to nuclear material, nuclear installations for decades. It's not only, you know, very recently, because such recommendations and for those who know exactly such recommendation, we call them in CIRC 225, and it was exactly, they were established in the 70s, and they were revised, and the fifth revision was issued last year. So countries have been using such recommendations, even if they are not mandatory, for several decades. And now, what we're trying to do is, I have mentioned one of the peer reviews we are offering to member states, is this International Physical Protection Advisory Service, IPAS. And although they are not mandatory, as we said, but de facto, and this is really what is important, de facto, all the countries now realize the importance of such peer reviews from the International Atomic Energy Agency, and they are asking the agency to come and assess the effectiveness of their physical protection systems. And this is, this is a big improvement. And as I mentioned earlier, last year we had three countries with major mature nuclear power programs. For example, France asked for physical protection to review their system, Sweden and United Kingdom. This year is the US ask for this, South Korea ask for this, China asked for a workshop first and then they will ask for it, Australia asked. And Countries committed themselves at many occasions, including the last nuclear security summit, that they would ask the agency to provide them with such peer review to assess the effectiveness of their physical protection systems. So only to tell you that although our standards are not mandatory, but de facto you see that countries now are using this. This is what happened to safety. It's you know, work in progress. There's another peer review there, we call it IRRS, Integrated Regulatory Service. Again, countries will ask the agency to go and assess the regulatory system, how effective it is and what should be improved. Again, it was not mandatory, but because they realized that this is important for them, it became de facto mandatory. For example, European Union, in one of their directives, they made it mandatory for all the 27 countries that they have to ask for IRS at least once every 10 years. What is happening for the nuclear security and physical protection that the EU also this year, there was a report prepared by an ad hoc group for nuclear security for this IPAS for the Council of Europe and the report 
has clearly mentioned that this IPAS, this peer review for physical protection, should be considered also de facto the norm, meaning they are thinking of making this mandatory for all the 27 countries. This means that the evolution is countries are realizing the importance of such standards and guidance and such peer reviews, and they are moving towards making them de facto mandatory. So I think only to, cl to clarify this. And, uh, and I think from the colleague from Japan, I think it was a comment, so it's not a question. It's only I take this opportunity to thank him that, yes, you're right. We, you know, a lot of lessons exactly through the, the transparent way we were getting from Japan, the report we were getting from Japan, and within this, the nuclear safety action plan, you know, each time there are now groups, experts, you know, meetings, and the lessons learned are shared exactly worldwide, and there will be also more exactly lessons learned, and Japan is really contributing a lot, you know, in sharing those lessons, and, and thank you for that. You have anything more to say? Uh, with that, um, uh, Jeffrey, pleasure to be working with IAEA once again and with you. Uh, Kamar, thank you very much for that clear exposition. And to the audience in particular, thank you for that series of excellent questions. You were more than paying attention. You were uh, making the proceeding even more interesting than it was. So I thank all of you. Uh, and with this. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you.